there you got the message. So uh, for those of you, that's for people who are unable to join today, I wish to watch it again in the future. But obviously we recognize that some people might be concerned about if you don't want to be recorded, then uh, don't say anything and turn your camera off. Or you can absolutely, of course, you can leave. But if you've got any questions regarding your data and privacy, you can contact the Health Research Authority's Data Protection Officer, Stephen Tebbett. Um, for accessibility, we will have closed captions for the session. Um, and we want this to be a welcoming, inclusive, safe, useful session. And there's some, I'm told there's some information about that in the, uh, uh, the Zoom chat for this session. And that brings me nicely to the Zoom chat. I'm going to start by asking them some questions shortly, but we want you to be, this is all about, the whole week's been really interactive. So if you want to ask a question, put your hand up or write it in the Zoom chat. We'll be monitoring that and we'll try and collect questions and give them to panelists as and when they arise. Um, I've been asked to make just a few opening remarks. I'm going to keep it really short because I don't want to steal Matt Westmore's thunder, our chief executive, who's going to be summarizing the week. But I have attended all four sessions this week. We start on Monday with um, raising awareness. I want to thank all the participants who came all week and all, all the organizers. I won't mention them by name, but the people who put this together for this week, it's hard enough. I know we're organizing one webinar, one conference, but five in a row is really a, a tribute to our staff. But everyone was very involved. Lucy Chapel gave the sort of keynote opening speech. She is the Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor to the Department of Health and are effectively our sponsor as an organization. The uh, Tuesday was feed about feedback to participants. Uh, the Wednesday was about publishing summary of results. And the Thursday, yesterday, was about increasing awareness of research opportunities. And that's really the only one I want to make a personal comment on. I was in a workshop about doing research on research, sometimes called meta-research. It's kind of an interesting idea, but I have done some research on research and it's really relevant to this. If I'm a, I'm a pediatrician, I look after sick children. If you're a child with cancer over the last 30 years and you were enrolled into a trial, your chances of survival are greater, irrespective of which arm of the trial you're in, than if you were not in a trial. And that shows that being involved in research is actually a good thing. You get very closely monitored, you get a lot of attention, people collect all the data they're supposed to collect. And so that message about is a message that we maybe need to get to the public. Being in research, people might think is risky, actually, for children's cancer anyway, and I think it's been shown for other topics you're actually better to be in a trial than not in a trial. And my tutor, when I was a medical student, David Graham Smith, he said that he was going to, I don't think he actually did this, but he said he was going to have a tattoo on his chest. If I'm admitted to hospital unconscious, enroll me in a trial. He felt he felt passionately then that, that you're better, your care will be better if you're in a, in a research study than just a random treatment. Oh, I don't mean random, sorry. Just kind of run-of-the-mill treatment that might be just up to the person you happen to see on the day. So I'm going to stop there. We On Monday, we had a really lovely introduction by Amanda Welling. She gave a uh, read out a poem that she's written. And I'm going to pass over to Amanda to read this. It was so, went down so well, we thought we'd repeat it. And then Amanda's going to hand back to me, and I'm going to make some introductions. So Amanda, over to you. First, remember to unmute myself. You think after all these years in a virtual reality, I'd know to do that by now. But um, just a little bit of background um, to the poem. Um, I'm actually autistic, so I think in words, and I think in words in a strange way. So when I was given the, the um, task to do a poem for this event, um, yeah, it came out kind of weird. So it's definitely out-of-the-box thinking, but I think it just brings brings up the, the problems that we face in, in, in making research um, transparent, I hope, for, I, ho I hope in an enjoyable, accessible, but also a serious way, because the, these, these are all real life things that, that I've included in it. So we march in March. Norm, the Trafalgar Square pigeon, scans the horizon from his roost. Atop the fourth column, atop the dust-covered journal of research gobbledygook, atop 
the long library ladder. Oh, so out of reach. He'd heard rumours it's a health research campaign up. He's, he's viewed scenes like this before, used to the kerfuffle beneath. Shrill sounds of whistleblowers, moving rainbow of banners and placards. Make transparency the norm, they chant. Curiouser and curiouser. Why they use my name? Please make it come, become clear. What do they want? I knows they want it now. Health Research Authority lead the march. Research the registry. I want feedback. Feed me now. Hungry for knowledge. My myalgic encephalomyelitis group plea to research with me about ME. Creative arts for arthritis. Mobilize my imagination. Free knowledge. Smash the paywall. The blog is mightier than the scalpel. Poetry informs me. Speak my language. Easy read for all, the message from a learning disabilities group. Draw me into, an in, into a cartoon. Inform in infographic. Research is a stage, perform for me. Spring me a research summary. Sharing knowledge saves scarce resources. So they march, mobilizing their knowledge, mobilizing their frustrations. I'm not here to tick your box, give me power, they chant. It's ethical to share. We already have the wheel. Such charity chants. Don't be blind to research results. Cancer charities, grow the knowledge, shrink the disease. Dementia charities, don't forget to tell us. Drums be out the rhythm of the masses as they march noisily but peacefully onwards. What do we want? Research transparency. When do we want it? Now. Shall we meet online instead? Share ideas and values together. Move forward the campaign. Mobilize our shared resources and powers. Change, not chant. We workshop in March the aim. Make transparency the norm. As for Norm the Pigeon, he goes back to his quiet life dreaming of giant ice creams. Off the pigeon, nevermore. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amanda. That was fantastic. And uh, bear second listening as well. Well done. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, so some introductions before we come to Matt, Chief Executive. Uh, our panellists, we've got uh, Andrew Freeman, who's non-executive chair of ISR CTN, which is an international trials registry. We have got Professor Andrew George, who is one of my colleagues on the board at the Health Research Authority and himself has been a chair of a research ethics committee and is now co-chair of the UK Committee on Research Integrity. Dr. Caroline Mitchell, general practitioner and primary care researcher at the University of Sheffield and Circle Steel, chief executive of the Y Yin Society and member of the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Research Advisory Group. And then uh, before we come to them, Matt Westmore, Chief Executive of the Health Research Authority is going to give a bit of a recap on the Make It Public Week that's been running all week. So over to you, Matt. Uh, thanks, Terence, and and add my thanks to to Amanda as well. It's a, a amazing poem, and I know it takes a lot of a lot of energy, a lot of effort to, uh, to 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 write and to perform. We really really appreciate it. Um, I'm actually going to do a uh, double act with Will. Is Will there? Yes, I'm here. So I'm going to I'm going to make some kind of more um, kind of wider ranging, uh, uh, perhaps waffly remarks. And then Will's going to kind of give us some uh, some interesting and useful uh, kind of uh, summary of um, uh, of what we've uh, what we've covered. Um, I guess not just this week, but also in the kind of the activities that, that have that have uh, spanned uh, and will span either side of the week as well. 
Um, so I wanted to start by um, where this all began, really, um, as a as a as a as an idea, and that was with the work of the Make It Public campaign group. Now, the Make It Public campaign group. Uh, it's all in the name. It's first and foremost, it's a it's a group. It's a group of organisations and individuals, uh, members of the public who, just as Terence said, share the same uh, commitment and passion for not just promoting research transparency, but for making it a reality. Uh, and that's what kind of aligns us. But the more important word is something that uh, that Derek raised as well earlier in the week. Derek Stewart, my co-chair of the Make It Public campaign group, and that's that it's a campaign. It's not a um, it's not a project or an implementation group or anything like that. Um, it's a, it's a it's a it's a campaign, um, and the reason for that is that it's not it's not the right approach. We don't believe, and it is not possible for one organisation or a small number of us to deliver research transparency through some kind of you know sort of project with Gantt charts and deliverables and work streams and and, and whatnot. Um, and the reason for that is, as we also heard a couple of times uh, this week in the different sessions, is that this is about this is this is more about culture change than uh, putting in place systems and uh, and actions. And you don't change culture with project plans. You you do that by taking the principles, the ideas, the passion, and the commitment, and trying to get them to snowball from one place and one time uh, all around the research the research world. And only through doing that will we find ourselves in a situation where transparency is easy, the norm, uh, expected and a reality. So we need something closer to a social movement than, uh, than an implementation project. Now, we're very proud uh, to be part of that and to flourish it. I, uh, uh, and I speak, I, I hope, on behalf of everyone that's involved in the Make It Public campaign group. Um, but it, we didn't invent it. It existed before us and it is far bigger than the Make It Public uh, campaign group. Um, and in fact, one of the achievements is this broader transparency community has made uh, in many ways is encouraging us to do things like public, publish the Make It Public um, strategy in 2020 and establish uh, the campaign group. Another one which we've seen this week uh, is we saw uh, the commitment being made by the UK government to enshrine in law responsibilities around transparency for uh, clinical trials. And some of these have never been legal requirements. Uh, before. Uh, so it means that the UK continues to lead the world uh, and also gives us a very strong legislative platform for the campaign to stand on. So it's something that already exists. It's a very special club. Um, and, um, uh, and in a way, what we've been doing through the Make It Public campaign group and this week is just picking the baton up, just playing our part, helping to, uh, to move it along. It doesn't belong to us. Uh, in a way, it belongs to all of you because people that have chosen to be with us and to engage with the various bits of uh, activity and content this week are, of course, the research transparency uh, community. So it belongs to all of you. And I would hazard a guess that you belong uh, to it, whether that's through attending the sessions, uh, presenting, being on the panel today, reading the report, uh, or just engaging with uh, the communications on, on Twitter and the like. That's all part of the transparency community. Now, I should say, Congratulations and welcome to this very, very special club. But I should also point out that there are terms and conditions to being in part of this club. And in fact, there are two rules to being in this club. The first is you must talk about the club uh, in uh, as distinct from, from some other clubs we might mention. You must talk about the Transparency Club. Pass it on, pass on your passion and your commitment. Help someone else that perhaps hasn't thought about it as deeply as you have uh, to change their thinking or their practice. And the second is to do something different yourselves. Uh, do something in your own world to improve your own transparency practice. And it doesn't have to be big and splashy uh, and grand like some of the things we've seen this week. It can just be a very, very small act of kinship with the research transparency community. And to help you do all of that, well, we put on not just uh, five uh, events, as Terence has said, but of course, a lot of other content and material uh, across the week, publishing a report, lots of communications going in the background. Uh, 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 and that's all focused on uh, um, making a difference in some really critical but narrow areas on research transparency. The first is raising awareness of research opportunities, the second feeding back to participants throughout the research project, and the final publishing summary results uh, at the end in accessible uh, and open ways. 
We also asked the team that uh, put the, this session on to make sure that we provided um, practical, practical and useful knowledge that, that you could take away uh, and use rather than just talk about why research transparency is important. We love talking about why research transparency is important, but we all know it's important. So we wanted what we wanted to do was really focus on things that you could take away uh, and, uh, and would be useful to you. Uh, and finally, we asked that it be a celebration of what already had been achieved, but also a look forward to what we needed to collectively take on next. And that's why this session is so important. So they're the sort of general points. I just want to hand over to Will now to make some, some kind of remarks about some of the specifics of what we've done this week. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, just kind of picking up where Matt left off there in terms of some of the workshop themes. So they were kind of the bulk of this week. They were part of our kind of central focus in terms of what Matt said there about as, as a member of the project team and as a member of kind of supporting the campaign group, we really wanted this to be a series of events where people would come, would hear things they maybe hadn't heard already, would share things of their own, own experience and own background, and would ultimately go away having learned something or having learned where to look for something else. The last thing we wanted was for a session for people to come, tune in, and then leave again and not really think about it. But we haven't had that. We've had three, uh, we've had a whole week of, of fantastic events, but in particular, three kind of core, really uh, passionately sort of contributed to workshops. So the first workshop, as Matt said, was about feeding back to participants. And there, some of the themes that the groups were discussing and referring to within that particular theme were about accessibility or about giving thanks and um, uh, giving thanks to participants and being really upfront with participants in terms of their impact and how their how their contributions will be used as, a, as the research progresses and also about opening that conversation about asking how you'd like to feed back to participants and kind of the theme about conversation and about deeply involving people is something that ran across all the workshop we've had and I'm sure it's something that will be discussed today because it was really clear to me as someone that was that was at, at all these workshops that the and people were coming with these fantastic examples of where they've been working from the outset between the study team, between researchers and participants and members of the public, the results had been so fruitful and the conversations so rich and, and detailed that everyone had benefited from the experience. And that, like I said, that was something that carried across each of the workshops. Um, I won't go into too much detail because there was so much rich discussion that we'll be bringing out. And as I've said to a few people who have, are on this call who were at those workshops, what we will be doing to continue that conversation is we will be uh, taking all the discussion, the evidence and the feedback from each of those dis breakout groups we had at each of those workshops, and we'll be producing a finalized kind of one page top tip for each of those themes. We'll be making that available on our website, be sharing it with all attendees across these workshops, and we'll be asking that you take these and you use them, you share them, and you kind of broadcast them as far as you can, because this is a, a really great resource that we've created together. It's not something that HRA has put up on its website and gone, there you go. It's something that everyone has collectively contributed to. And, and I think that's going to be fantastic. And if I can just finish with one kind of final quick remark is another ambition that we had for this for this week was that we wanted to make these workshops and this event as open and as accessible as we could. And we wanted to see a really broad range of people and experiences and backgrounds come. And from my perspective, we've achieved that. We had a huge range of uh, different kind of professional and personal experience representing these workshops and a really great mix of people from, from across the spectrum and beyond. So I just like to really say thank you to everyone who attended and shared their experience. And hopefully we'll just continue to grow this conversation. Um, so on that, I'll just hand back to Terence and say thank you again. Well, thanks to Will and Matt for that super summary, succinct summary of, a, of an exciting week. Um, so I've already flagged for you that you can, uh, uh, you can we, we want to hear questions from you. Um, and you can also flag your questions and share your thoughts. I've already seen some in the, the Zoom chat, but you can flag them on social media using the hashtag, the hashtag make it public. Um, but I'm going to start by asking a question of each of our panelists to get things rolling. So I'm going to start with Andrew Freeman, who runs an international trials registry. Andrew, uh, we've met before. It's lovely to see you again. From what you've heard this week and your own personal experience, what does transparency in research mean for you? Uh, hi, Terence. Hi, everybody. Uh, as uh, Terence said, I'm uh, the new non-executive chair of the ISRCTN registry, which is the UK registry. And before that, I spent a long while at Glatzis with Klein, where I headed up uh, data disclosure. Just to give you a bit of context for my kind of remarks, 
Um, I mean, I do uh, agree with what Matt just said around transparency uh, being a call to change, although I'm a little bit cynical, if I'm honest. Uh, I've been involved in conversations about transparency, must be going back to 2003, 2004. Uh, and yet, if you look at the HRA report that came out this week, uh, only 44% of uh, studies had results with their registration. So there is some way to go, I believe, in converting that uh, desire for transparency into, into reality. Um, and I think I would kind of split up, you know, in terms of uh, what transparency means into a kind of, you know, what it is and, and how it should be done. Because I think that culture change needs to be done with a framework for implementation that has that what and that how. Um, and so in terms of the what, I think it's been discussed a lot this week, you know, what is transparency? Well, it's about uh, posting a protocol summary for your research before it begins. It's about posting a results summary uh, within 12 months after the, end of the, uh, after the end of the study. It's about um, making sure participants are informed uh, uh, about the outcome of studies. And I would say uh, making available a plain language summary for, for most studies at the end, so that not only the participants, but the broader community can understand the findings. Um, and I'll also, also add to that, and something that hasn't really been the focus of this week, is making plain language, uh, sorry, patient level data, anonymized patient level data available for further uh, research. Um, that has been done now for a number of years. Industry has, have led that, um, and I think there's more that can be done uh, in that area as well. So that's kind of the what around transparency. I think there's important conversations about how best to, to do that. Um, and I think the themes there uh, are around making sure that information can be easily found, it can be easily accessed, it can be easily understood, and it can be easily used. You know, I would argue there's no point in being trans uh, transparent and making all that information available if people can't find it and use it. Um, so they're, they're the kind of the, 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 the key uh, points for me. Um, I was also pleased to see the government response uh, to the consultation that recently came out uh, to put in place legislation to make sure transparency happens. I think you know, it's more than, more than a culture. I think they have to make sure it happens through uh, a legislative framework um, and, and with flexibility built in. I was also pleased to see that there was provision in the response for exceptions to be made when, when, when justified. Um, so I think that, that framework uh, is important with that flexibility uh, built in. So I've probably gone on enough around my views on transparency. I hope that uh, was reasonably clear. Yeah. No, that's a really helpful start, Andrew, and I'll be trying to sum up at 2.20. We're going to be finishing on time at 2.30. But I really liked your emphasis on accessibility for the public. There's no point in going through the motions if it's, uh, if it's not... Uh, tailored for the public who, who are going to be using it. Okay, I'm going to turn now to Dr. Caroline Mitchell, who's a GP and researcher in Sheffield, and ask Caroline, um, what are some of the key ways we as a research system, so that includes the Health Research Authority, but it's wider than that, for, for members of the public, what do we mean by research system? We mean everybody who's involved in it, researchers, public, pharma, universities, the NHS, the government, the regulators, the funders, that's the system that lets research happen. What do you think are the key ways in that research system, Caroline, that we could work better together in the future to make transparency more the norm, to use Amanda's phrase? You're on mute, Caroline. Thank you. I'm okay now. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm a GP of 32 years. I've worked in frontline practice, seeing patients in the same practice. It's a relatively deprived area of Sheffield. Um, so I can't get away with uh, talking gobbledygook to my patients. I wouldn't have lasted very long. Um, I also lead a research group, an inclusive research group, um, which uh, we call the Deep End Research Alliance. And it's a, it's a triad of patients, public, researchers, and frontline clinicians, where we have respectful conversations conversations with humility and learn from each other about our perspectives and we start from the ground up um, and and what we've learned over our sort of seven year journey since we set up a cluster research network in the most deprived areas of Sheffield the most ethnically diverse we've learned along the way as I say with humility that what's key 
is that people need to build trust and dialogue uh, by exchanging ideas in community settings with community uh, members co-facilitating those uh, research workshops. If you start at the beginning there, it is normalized that you speak and talk to your to your um, co-producers of your research who are the public uh, patients and communities. Um, knowledge is power. And so, um, you know, what we do is we have kind of introductions, we might do a lay summary of the literature relevant to the research, and we expect our researchers to come. And what we found is that researchers themselves are, are, are not very skilled in talking in plain English and, um, and also adapting their, their uh, research to consider uh, the diverse, rich cultures of our country. Um, so we have lay summaries and we um, uh, we bring in topic experts to do questions and answers, and that's just normal for us. Um, and we support the, um, the development of research skills in the community. We've moved that to another phase now where and uh, now we're training uh, community researchers to work alongside us in our research, um, you know, particularly for qualitative research, co-facilitating and interviewing um, with us. And we've done this with the support of NIHR Strategic Business Funding. Um, so. You know, that's just a brief sort of uh, description of what we do. And what we found is that by going out and training people, I thought like, it was a great sort of idea about kinship. Of course, we can't do it all on our own. In fact, we're inundated with people who want to speak to our diverse patient and public involvement group who are actually recruited from those most deprived areas who traditionally, uh, they don't know anybody who's ever participated in a research study. Not no, Nobody. It's literally unheard of. But they've become uh, research champions in our community. And the tragedy of, of COVID help galvanize us and we've delivered sort of studies to people who've been put in the too too hard to reach group um you know too hard to uh, to work with and we proved that it isn't true we did 10 qualitative studies in three years with impossible to reach people apparently and we had no problems um you know we just had to adapt our studies and um, embed uh, publicity. And I'm proud that usually our lay summaries go out before any of the research in the, in the journals of gobbledygook. Thank you. Thanks very much, Caroline, for reminding us that it's important that it's also relevant and accessible for people from deprived parts of the country and for hard to reach groups. And I will certainly, prompted by Amanda, I'll certainly be scanning my own CV for my publications in the Journal of Research Gobbledygook. That's a, that's a good reminder. I'm going to turn now to one of my colleagues, Andrew George. Andrew is also, like Caroline, a researcher. He's more interested in how the immune system responds to, to infections and cancers, things like that. He's also been involved more later in his career in, in working with the Mental Health Trust. So Andrew's... Uh, and I said in my introduction, himself as chair of the Research Ethics Committee. So, Andrew, for you, uh, the, the big question, everyone, is, this is the big one. What about sanctions? As uh, Andrew Freeman said, we've been talking about this a long time, um, exhorting people, encouraging them, being nice. When are we going to get tough as the, I think the Science and Technology Committee asked the HRA back in 2018? When are we going to start finding them and sending them to prison and all those bad things? Thank, thank you, Terence, for, for saving the tough one for me then, I guess. Um, first of all, introductions. Yes, I'm Andrew George, and I'm also involved in the Health Research Authority, and I was privileged to be able to chair the, uh, two th the development of the 2020 strategy. And it's really fantastic to see some of that now being enshrined in some of what people told us they needed uh, enshrined in legislation. So it's really good to, to see that. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the UK Committee on Research Integrity, um, and of course, transparency is one of the pillars of research integrity as laid out in the UK Concordat. And this applies to all research, not just health research. It applies to humanities research, um, art research, as well as anything else. And so alongside uh, honesty and accountability uh, and rigor and care of respect, transparency is one of the big pillars um, of research. And so this is an issue, not just for those of us who are interested in research that's involved in health and social care, but also for all of the research. Um, and so sometimes we need to think about this a little bit broader. So your question is, uh, at what point do sanctions bring about change? Um, and I think it's worth thinking about what sort of change do we need? Um, I, I remember a book talking about 
how do we deal with polluting cars? Um, and you can stand there and there are basically two ways you can deal with cars that pollute and your ambition is to reduce the amount of pollution. One of them is to find a way of increasing all of the cars energy efficiency so they all get better you shift the bell shaped curve from one place to another place uh, and that way you are lifting the performance of everybody involved in it to a better place so you're going from bad to good or from good to, to better but you're shifting the curve the other thing that you're also sometimes wanting to do is you're wanting to identify the worst polluting cars that are driving past you, and you're just wanting them to remove them from the circulation. So you're pulling out the cars that are actually well outside that bell-shaped curve and are performing badly. And I think that when we are talking about research transparency and getting researchers to do for research transparency, we need to think about which of those that we're doing. We're doing both of those at different times, but we need to think about when it's appropriate to do them. And so sanctions is really about identifying that tail of the, the, the place where people are doing it badly wrong, uh, and then removing those or dealing with those, or as Terence says, finding some way to sanction those. And I think that we do need to do that at some stage, and but, we, but with there seem to need to be some conditions that we need to be have outlined before we do that. We need to be make it very clear to researchers what we are expecting to them. We have to tell them what the norm is, to use the words uh, of, of the pigeon. Uh, we also have to make it easy for them. Um, we, we have to make it so that they can uh, do the right thing. And we also have to be clear what we are going to measure in order to identify good performance and bad performance uh, in order to do the sanctions. And so I think all of these um, ha have to come into the mix. And so we need to think then about each of the strands that we have in research transparency and work out, are we at the stage where we are taking that bell-shaped curve and we're trying to shift the performance? We're trying to raise, if you like, all of the votes. Or are we trying to deal with those people who are actually just not playing ball, who are not doing it right? And I think that we're in different places and different parts of it. I would say, for example, in trial registration, we are clearly in the area where we should be in the area of identifying those who are not doing the right thing uh, and moving them forward. For other areas, we need to be more subtle about it and we need to think more about the carrot and stick. But actually, I also think that we need to think about it in terms of getting the system right, and that can be the most productive way. And so what I'm going to describe now, I'm not sure whether it's a sanction or what, but an area of research transparency where this country is absolutely world leading, uh, it's absolutely world leading in open access for research. Uh, and that means that the published research papers are available uh, in this country, far, a far higher proportion of them are available for researchers, whether those researchers or, or indeed anyone in the public who wants to read them, they're not accessible in terms of accessible language, but the research findings are available for researchers or for policymakers or for those who want to implement them. And that's been done because of a variety of things. It's been done because, first of all, some of the big funders, most notably Welcome, but then the UKRI funders as well and NIHR said, actually, if we fund your research, you've got to make this research available. And then things like the REF, which is the way in which all universities are judged on their research abilities, and therefore actually all researchers end up wanting to comply to that one because that means money, made it clear that only publications that were open access were available. And that's had a massive effect on it. Is that carrot, is that stick? I don't think it matters. Is it that you know, your, your, your papers don't get counted uh, if they aren't open access? Is that a carrot, is that a stick? I don't know. But that's actually something that has had an immense change. And so I think we need to be thinking about that. How do we get the system? And so it's easy for researchers to do what it's clear for them to do and that we can measure that they've done it. And when we've done that, most researchers will move in the right way. And then we need to think about sanctions for those, those that are unable to do it. So thank you. I hope that's useful, Terence. No, that's a very useful reminder, Andrew, that we need carrot and stick and not just stick. And that's a, a, a timely reminder. And your finishing remarks about measuring segues nice into what I want to ask uh, Circle Steel, who's from the Ethnic Minority Research Advisory Group. Essentially, how will we know when researchers are being more transparent? What, what will success look like? Um, 
for both health and social care, remembering that both the Health Research Authority and the and NICE over the last few years have been made responsible for not just medical health research, but also social care research, which often lag, lags behind. So Circle, what would success look like? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for invitation. Uh, my name is Circle Steele. I'm the uh, Chief of Worldwide Society. We are the community organization, uh, develop a lot of health and social care support service in the community. What's the service like? One thing asked me, I'm not a clinician and I also know medical background, but we work a lot our community member, English their second language, okay? And they they also take part in a lot of research from so many, so many groups asking them. Community engagement is very important, but community engagement in a meaningful way, okay? Not just coming in, take the boss, I do the research and go away. Time and time, long time ago, a lot of research like that and never get back, tell us what your research found out. Our, our older people, our people with mental health or cancer, they've been asking and no result. Okay, some of the research report come out, we say, what, what, what was the outcome? What is the impact to the community member? Why I want to take part? Because I don't know what you find, what you're finding. If you're finding your language <laughs> or in English. Okay, so if somebody think about those community member, you and what you mentioned, you engage them, you disseminate your finding in a meaningful way. But current, I'll give you an example, okay? Is um they come back with the very creative cartoon artwork to them. What we find out now, we come back to to disseminate. It's very meaningful, yeah. They do very creative way, they learn uh, with the cartoon, very big poster. Then we're asking, do you have a Chinese language? Mm -hmm. They do in two groups. One is a Chinese group, Chinese speaking group, our older people doesn't speak any other language. One is a Polish group. So so they say, oh no. So come back, think about, so they come back very nice poster. And then they will go back to translate in Chinese language, one in the Polish language. Those people engage. So not only those user, uh, Take part they know what's the outcome and then what look like they understand what it means they what they contribute but the wider community member can look at i told my colleague we need to frame that poster now this is dissemination learning and also evidence base if we put in the some of the journal none of the people can access especially digital skill some of the community minority disability poverty and and what i want to see more is more that kind of community engagement in a meaningful way and we are not hard to reach, talk about African Caribbean group. We're all here in the community in Manchester. Just how's the way uh, the research engage in social care setting. And also they, they can bring the interpreter or community worker to be part of that, helping them to interpret what the information is doable. That is uh, um, that's what we call cultural change. It also, also being social change as well, because they will change the way our community members say, oh, what I what I take part is very meaningful. I can contribute much bigger and the NHS or for other people. Otherwise they won't understand. They come to ask me and then what's going on and what happened next now. So time and time we work very creative way. Uh, Carol and I, you say, yes, right. It's called collaboration partnership. Copo juice is good. And also at some point we have to uh, work around about how our user uh, feedback their comment and how they can understand your, your research recommendation, for example, or what they contribute is meaningful to them, to the community members. Yes, they need to build trust and then the relationship got to be established. The, what I call it's quality relationship. It's not just, I want a group I come in, or I want to use of cancer come into research. It's that kind of relationship is they, they think is, is sustainable and mean, meaningful for them. The other interest about, they talk about the artwork. Uh, we have a poster, okay, your, your funding in our center. But what I want to see is those funding, your health research funding recommendation all over the street, okay? Oh, it looks fire, yeah, that's just something creative. Can you can see the street art. One day, I remember walking on the Manchester, I can see the COVID-19, some of the recommendations for the artwork. We see that is impact uh, done by some of the research. So you can think of different way to make it public, not just in the journal or, or video or document or, or plain English uh, document. It may be some street art people when they see it, oh, this is a, that is a health finding recommendation. Thank you, yeah. No, thank you, Circle, for emphasizing that it's not just, as Caroline said, deprived, people from deprived communities and hard to reach, but I think the census has just been published. I think it was 14% of the UK population 
and I'm from black and minority ethnic groups or self-identify. So you, you're, it's a very good reminder that we need to think about other languages and infographics and other ways of displaying information. Okay, we're going to be breaking at 13.50 so for our first break. So I'm going to turn to Will. If we can have quick answers and quick questions, then we'll get a bit more interactive. So Will, what's the first question you want to bring up? Um, lovely. So the first, I'd actually like to bring um, Peter Hart in to ask this first question directly if we can. So Peter, over to you. Thank you. So much. Um, thanks, everyone. I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the session on primary care. Um, and I've got an answer to a question from Caroline. But Caroline, in primary care, why I, I was involved with an infrastructure committee earlier in the year with NIHR. And we found that only 224 GPs are actively involved in research. And obviously, we, we, we found out that um, things like um you know say with people are finding out in a and e that they've got liver cirrhosis and you know i'm looking at something at the moment could fiber scan be introduced in primary care but it did strike me as a really really struck me that uh, the opportunity in primary care i think 312 million appointments is it because gps are just so busy and so and literally sort of um you know chasing their tail one day to the next or is you know, and I also noticed pharmacists, and you know, in fact, there was 0.4 percent of those registered are involved in in research, and 0.1 percent of nurses and midwives. And I know my pharmacist says the same thing; they would love to be involved, but it's a time thing. I just wonder what you think about the opportunity there. And okay, I really so for, enjoyed what you said. About okay, thanks, Pete. So, for all 74 participants, primary care encompasses. Is everything includes general practice, health visiting, district nurses, pharmacists, that's all primary care. But, but I guess the main academics would be like Caroline would be GP. So over to you, Caroline. Oh, well, thank you very much for asking that question. Um, I've been over 25 years doing research in practice and close to practices, um, right from the start of early cluster research networks. And as you say, um, we're frontline clinicians. And unlike in hospitals, it's a postcode lottery whether there's actually any research infrastructure to even support um, uh, practices um, and also those other community settings to, uh, um, to enable research participation. Everything from research offices and things like that. And across the country, it's uneven um, mm. because the redistribution of research resources follows the research that takes place there. So if you, uh, so there you have this sort of awkward situation where say chronic obstructive airways disease, chronic lung disease is highest in, in the northwest of the, city, uh, northwest of the country or in areas that are very deprived, but most of the research is concentrated in London. Um, so that's just a first example that the money doesn't, isn't matched in research, researchers and research active communities. It isn't matched to where the patients are. The second thing is, is there's a national shortage of all primary care staff, nurses, doctors, um, and particularly after COVID, it's, um, it's made a lot of the research efforts to widen uh, research participation in primary care stall um, because people simply haven't got the time. And even um, when things are funded, they can't get the locums to cover seeing their patients whilst they do the research activities. Uh, finally, research records are sacrosanct. Are, you know, what happens when a, 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 the person comes in to see their GP and talks about their, their health issues? Um, we have to have a whole load of checks and balances because those conversations are very, very personal. And now it's great that patients can access and read that as well. Uh, but the idea that, that we can have helicopter researchers landing on our premises and, and, and doing research um, within the practices without working with the teams isn't going to happen uh, because we have to protect confidentiality. Um, so there's a number of barriers, but there's a lot of enthusiasts and where, you know, I described the deep end practice, where there are resources put into those practices, you can really change things, uh, but we need to do it in every way and build um, capacity. We've been waiting for a long time for it to come and it does need uh, the resources to support it. Does that answer your question? It's a lot. Yes. It's, there's a lot of complicated things. Uh, I'll say this about patients as well. They hate helicopter researchers who turn up two weeks before the grant and say, I need somebody to join my grant application. 
they it doesn't build trust and and the same goes across the whole thing so i work with a i've supervised a phd to completion of pharmacist who's passionate about research and she's working for nhs england now and um, so we hope this will change watch this space thanks caroline i love what you said um, about deep end i thought that was fantastic i'll, I'll google that later yeah well i'll share our patient public involvement report i think that one might work okay Thank thanks for the really question, Peter, and thanks, Caroline, for answering it. Um, Jacinta or Will, who are we going to next? Um, so I think we've got one more question before the break, and I'm going to read this on behalf of uh, Michael Elsie, who, who just can't read, read it right now. So it was just to say that he enjoyed the car anal analogy, the possible steps, and the need for real estate expectations to be set out for researchers first. Since the number is rather low for dissemination of results, about 29%, how do we provide researchers incentive to share the research findings to the participants. Michael worked in a trust sponsorship team and it was mentioned that the EOS report dissemination plan being adhered to will be compulsory. So I just wondered, that's kind of an open question for the for anyone from the panel. Uh, that's for you, first of all, Andrew, anyway, I think. So, certainly, I, so Will, I think, I, I think you're talking about, I, I couldn't quite catch everything you said, but you're talking about the dissemination of results to participants. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's low at the moment. It used, I mean, again, this is something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, and I reckon we, you know, I think we've got to recognise we're on a journey. I think the journey's taken too long. I remember when I chaired a research ethics committee, it's probably now about 12, 13 yeah. years ago, I used to ask researchers always, how were they going to disseminate the results of the patients? And in those days, I was really pleased if the answer was, I'll send them a copy of the paper, because even though that was not the right thing to do, at least it was a start and we were getting things moving. Um, and so, and, and to me, this is something who, as somebody who also takes part in research is, is, is really important. Um, I still think we need to do work in making those expectations clear to people. That this is what they have to do. The, the, the strategy saying that this was absolutely what we had to do came out in 2020. Um, research projects typically take three or so years to operate. Um, I think it takes time. We as the, uh, in the Health Research Authority also need to really make it clear that that's what they have to do. We have to make it, uh, find mechanisms to helping people take it because it's something that sounds very easy. And in many cases it is very easy, but in some cases it's very, very difficult. If you take something like the Recover study, a study which was the absolutely amazing study uh, that happened during COVID, uh, where it was a platform study where different uh, drugs uh, were put in, and that's the study that showed that steroids were effective, for example, that um, chloroquine wasn't effective and so on. It was one that produced all of those really important results and something that the UK can be really, really proud of because it was something that we were able to do that other countries couldn't do. And so we really helped people there. But if you look at that study, the researchers who were all based in Oxford do not know who took part in their study because that study was recruited uh, in other places. And so if you look at that, it's actually really complicated that for them to feed back the results because they didn't know who was taking part in the study and they uh, and then they, they didn't know who had died and shouldn't be approached for uh, and so on and so forth. Now, that's not to mean that you shouldn't do it. But actually, I think that's where places like the Health Research Authority have a real role in helping behind the scenes get the wiring of the NHS working so that information can flow from one place of the NHS to the other place of the NHS. So those letters can, uh, you know, so that information can be set out. Uh, I'm also seeing that more and more people are doing this in interesting ways. I mean, Circle's um, thing about the cartoons uh, and, and, and getting language is absolutely right. Actually, there are, you know, there are the ways. What's the right way of getting that information across? So I think the question was, how do we do this better? I think that we are now in the place where people know they have to do it. We've got to make it easy for them to do it. And we've got to spread this really good practice and demonstrate why it's important for people. I hope that answered the question, at least partly. That's lovely, Andrew. Thank you so much. Okay, we're at 13.51. I'm going to give you all a five-minute comfort break. Andrew's already drinking his tea, but if you want to make a quick cup of tea, and we'll be back at 13.56 to carry on taking your questions in the Zoom chat. So see you shortly.
Okay, well, it's 13.56. Uh, Will, are you there? And Jacinta? Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can, oh, I don't think we can work out how many people are back because we're probably all still logged in. So it's still showing, okay. Well, we'll have to assume everyone's here. Um, there's a question I saw, a theme in the, Caroline Mitchell actually posed for Andrew George and Circle. So Circle, you can have first crack at this. Do you think journals, scientific journals, medical journals, as a matter of course, 
should insist that a web accessible lay easy read summary is available for every paper published. What do you think about that as a suggestion of a way forward? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I think, yeah, because this, this is a health research, we will do some plain English, a simple summary for the mm -hmm. journal for, depends on your audience, okay? If your audience for the academic people, uh, professor, research doctor, they, I think there's no problem. If though for those community member, you really going down to the uh, local community member, is they're part of the contributor, even some of our users, no Wi-Fi, the internet property, so no digital property, sorry, it's not that accessible. That's what I'm saying. It's got to be culturally appropriate for certain group and certain audience. Yeah. So in a way, at some point, you've got to be a little bit flexible. Now, I mentioned before about community organization engagement, because they are the one can build the trust with the organization. And then we as a charity always, on the other way, demanding the, the research. Why from the beginning, when you design your research, make sure all the resources are appropriate, allocated to the to the sector and then the user to take part, including learning and dissemination. How you learning, how you share your learning and dissemination, your research got to be come back from the community group from the beginning. Yeah. And and that is uh, that is what I'm saying. It's the involvement is a meaningful involvement. Yeah, got, got to be very well. Some journal is okay if the people are academic can access from our community members, from our older people, they won't. So another interesting thing, when the poster of the cartoon, they are we, we put it on our community center. Every visitor coming on, we we told them what did they do with the university. Even from even from our service user, we lived the experience, they're part of the part of the ambassador uh, champion that, that, that that's what they do to the university. We're part, we're very meaningful for them, yeah. So I say sometimes if you look, look at you look back, okay, the uh, summary of the paper, but sometimes involve people with lived experience to share that learning and experience is very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. No, I like your idea of community engagement. There was a some researchers wanted to study diabetes in the Asian population. And to do that at that time, they needed what were called fasting blood sugars. Mm -hmm. And by talking to the Asian community, they said, well, why don't you do the research during Ramadan? Everyone's fasting anyway. Yeah. Which is very yeah. And that's exactly what they did. And the recruitment went through the roof because they weren't asking people to do something. Of it. So that, I think for, that was a big message for me of the power of involving your community. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what about this? Make make it mandatory that uh, I mean, Circle said for uh, it doesn't matter for professors and researchers. I actually find <laughs> I find that reading research has got progressively more difficult, more telegraphic as they reduce the word limits. And I would really love everything to have a, a simple a search summary for me, too. But over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's several things I want, I want to say here. First of all, I really am a great fan on helping researchers um, write things or communicate, not always write things, sometimes communicate things in plain language. When I was the director of the graduate school at Imperial, we introduced a scheme that meant that uh, all of the PhD students had to do some form of communication activity about their research, whether that was written or standing on a soapbox in the Natural History Museum telling people going past it uh, or whatever. There was a variety of things they could do because I think it's a really important way of researchers sometimes really understanding the basis of what they uh, are trying to do and, 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 and explain it. I, I also think that a lot of journals are moving in the right direction. You know, um, I, I'm finding more and more journals are asking me when I write my articles to put the key points in, you know, in two or three key points. And I think that's the starting of being it. Um, and, and so I think that, and in some cases, I think that's going to be the right thing to do. I do think we need to do a little bit of thinking about the granular, what I call the granularity of what level we do this at. So for example, if I'm doing a research project involving, if I've got an ethics mm -hmm. approval to do a research project, which involves a large number of participants, is the plain language, is the feedback best done at the level of that research ethics committee that might produce two or three papers underneath, or is it best done at the level of the paper? Um, if you look at some of the papers I publish, I publish papers that really um, you know, involve patients and participants in the research, and those I think absolutely I've got to communicate in clear English what they're doing. I also do have papers that are expounding, are, are, are developing new mathematical techniques, and these are 10 pages, frankly, of equations, and I'm only expecting 10 people in the world to read them. I really don't expect anybody else to read them. 
Um, and that's all they're there for, actually. And so in those cases, I think that there is a purpose for me communicating, why is it worth me doing this research? But possibly they're not at the level of the paper, probably at the level of the research program that I'm doing, that I should be able to tell the public why their money is well spent. I'm not sure, uh, and that therefore at the level of the program, I need to be able to be saying that. Um, I'm not sure that that paper would be particularly enhanced uh, by, by, by something like that. So. Yes, but not 100% is, I guess, my answer. But yes, we should be doing it 100%. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Caroline, you want to come back on that? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to mention, so on the big numbers, complicated things, one of the problems we have in general practice is, say, for example, if a big journal um, publishes <clears throat> a paper saying that a certain contraception increases people's risk of breast cancer, people come through the door and expect us to be able to translate it and that often that kind of stuff is is a sort of hot topic or or anything to do with the sort of menopause that then is plastered across all the media but often with really poor lay um explanations that go alongside the paper that allow people to see you know the flaws in the study the strengths the limitations and what this actually means in terms of clinical practice um, so I agree with you that there are certain types of things which, you know, you might need to, you know, graduate level maths to understand. But I think if we're doing, um, you know, research that's got clinical relevance and that will be picked up by, uh, you know, the red top, uh, red top newspapers, we've got a duty to, to disseminate lay, evidence, lay summaries at the same time. It makes I, work. I, I support that. Caroline. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a lot about journalists, journals, but journalists also have a responsibility in making research transparent for the public. And I won't dwell on this, but but uh, if I had a pound for every time journalists confuse association and causation, and another pound for every time they confuse absolute risk and relative risk, I would be a multimillionaire. Um, I'm going to pass it back, Jacinta. Will I've got a question for Andrew? But if there's any questions from the from the audience, I'd rather take their questions first for Andrew Freeman. But Will, just enter any questions in the chat? Yes, yeah, we've got quite a few coming through. So I'm okay. just going to hand straight over to Francis Mozzi. Uh, Francis, if you'd be happy to ask your question. Oh, yes. Um, fine. And what I was thinking about is going back to the beginning of research and when you get your protocol together. Um, at the end of the protocol, there's always a place for dissemination and findings and how you're going to disseminate the findings. Now, um, in the UK law that we've spoken about, which has come up just recently as regards what they're passing as regards transparency, is there anything in that at all that addresses the protocol? Because at the beginning... It is probably, yeah, everything has to come from the top, but at the beginning is the best place to start. And if you've got a guidance for the dissemination and findings as to how you're going to disseminate these findings, then um, can't we move forward from that? That's a great question, Francis. And it sort of <laughs> aligns with what I, I want to ask. So this week we've talked actually a lot about transparency and publishing research at the end. But Andrew Freeman mentioned in his introductory remarks that part of the reason for registering is that you say up front what you're going to do. And, and Andrew, I think, was referring to you, know, you you need to specify in advance what your hypothesis is and how you're going to analyze the data. But to Francis's point, do you find on your registry people are specifying how they're going to share with the public and disseminate and make it transparent at the end as well as at the beginning? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't think people are doing that as part of uh, registration in terms of outlining how they're going to disseminate the, the findings. I do think, though, that to the point that was made, I think it is good practice to at least outline what the dissemination plan is going to be for the research, recognising you don't know what the findings are going to be, so that might change things down the line. It might be some uh, great findings, some, uh, something that um, needs further dissemination than compared with what you originally plan but I think it is important such that you don't uh, cherry pick the findings so that you don't select the findings that you found that support your particular view of the world um, so that if you can be as, as, as broad as possible at the, at the outset uh, by being clear what the primary 
outcomes are, but I've been clear what the key secondary outcomes are, the fact that you're going to disclose mm -hmm. that, I think that is, is very important. I mean, certainly from a registration standpoint, there's now a requirement to disclose a data sharing plan. So how researchers are going to share their patient level data from, from, the, from the study. Uh, and that can range from, I'm not going to share it through to, I'm going to share it through a, a, a platform. I think that is a welcome uh, development. Uh, but I think more can be done in that area as well, because you know our plan can be, I'm not going to share, thanks very much. When I think there, sh there should be an onus on people sharing, while also recognising there may be very good reasons why it doesn't make sense to do so. There may be a very small study in 12 patients, just a blood sample taken. Mm -hmm. You know, is that really going to be worthwhile putting all the infrastructure in place to share those data? So I think that the the the, the uh, to the question, I think yes, uh, data dissemination plans are a good idea, and I think the more you can do that upfront in a protocol and to yeah. a certain extent in registration. I don't want to overburden registration because then it becomes it doesn't become an easy process. Um, I think that is good practice. Thanks, Andrew. Does anyone, Andrew George, you want to come in on that? I mean, just yeah. yes, just saying your ethics application, you have to say you have to give how you're going to disseminate the data um, as well. So there's an opportunity there, which we raised in the 2020 um, strategy for using that to drive uh, increased dissemination as well. So, so, so the ethics application is a place where we do that. Okay, right. thanks. Um, Thank you very Jacinta, much. Thank well, you. Jacinta, Will, any other questions in the Zoom chat? Yes, yes, uh, plenty. So if I could come to Derek Stewart, if you could ask your question and probe about sanctions, if you'd be okay to do that. No, because I can't remember what question. <laughs> do you want me to, shall I ask it? or who you yeah, to... Okay, so Derek asked, just to reverse. So Derek asks, should we be should we now be looking towards a range of sanctions, uh, which we covered in the introduction, but specifically things like naming, supporting, challenging, excluding? Uh, I know we touched on this at the beginning, but I guess is there any kind of further thoughts on those so, four areas? I'll come in briefly, Will. Well, it was more of the notion of if we just now start thinking somebody will be sanctioned, what we need to be doing is thinking of the range of sanctions was my thinking, but I'd be interested in those things. Okay, I think that's one initially for Andrew George. So Andrew, you've talked about carrot and stick, but this is a bit more granular, what kind of sticks? So I I think there's several sticks. And again, I, I, sometimes I find it difficult to differentiate between sticks and carrots uh, in things. Um, and, but I think actually making that, it, you know, making it, to make for us to make it transparent what the data is out there. So, in other words, if the University of Bognor Regis, nobody from the University of Bognor Regis has ever published any data from their results and has never shared their data with anybody else, then um, if we make that transparent, I think that would have an immense effect on the um, behavior of the University of Bognor Regis and on individual researchers in it. Um, and I also think that that is the sort of thing that will have an impact because those researchers will also realize that that is data that is going to be used in grant giving bodies and ethics applications and everything else because researchers want their research to be useful they want it to be used they want to get money for it and actually if they're not doing good research because they're not doing the stuff that is this transparency it's actually necessary for them to be doing good research then they wouldn't done so to me there's a lot of without going into naming and shaming um, there's a lot of actually making data transparent make us making the data transparent i think would have an immense effect uh, on people's behavior thank you thanks andrew and i've got andrew freeman's got his hand up as well so Go for it, Andrew. Yeah, I just wanted to to make a comment on sanctions and you know what needs to be put in place to make sure that you're transparent. And just go back to my history at GlaxoSmithKline, where we had a very uh, strong policy around disclosure. Now, how did that happen? It didn't happen because there were sanctions at, at the end of the process. It happened because we had a policy. We had a, a process in place. We made sure people were trained on it. We had internal audits. We had potentially external audits. We had a whole quality management framework 
around making sure we were transparent we were transparent and i think some of that can be put in place in in institutions in research institutions to do the same thing and I, if i look back at what made the biggest difference for us it was very simple and it's kind of <laughs> statement the obvious we just had a very simple monthly dashboard all our studies and from that dashboard, we could see whether uh, studies have been disclosed on time from a protocol standpoint, from a result standpoint, mm -hmm. publication submission standpoint, from a sharing data standpoint. And that, that went to senior management. And if it was below a threshold of whatever it was 95%, questions were asked. And that made the biggest difference in all my, uh, in all my uh, career at GlaxoSmithKline. That was the, just having a simple dashboard made a huge difference. Part of management monitoring, um, uh, so I think there's just more than sanctions. It's about having an overall quality management framework in place. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Will, next question. Uh, yeah, so next question, I'm going to go to Naho. That's okay. Hi, thanks. Um, I put something in the chat about carrots for um, encouraging plain English summary, but I think that got um, answered in a way, and it's about demonstrating the benefit of doing that. Um, but the other question I had was, is there a value um, in having a central place to um, uh, uh, for people to access these pl plain English summaries? And if so, what's the best location for that? Um, would it be journals or registries or something like be part of research um, that we heard about um, um, yesterday from Imogen Shirto? And if that is the case, then how do we overcome some of the, the digital access issue that, that we heard about? Because I mean, I, it's very likely that it will be accessible through a, um, a, a digital means. Okay, who wants to take that question about, there's two parts, about how, how best do you make this available? And what about people who in circles, Fraser, have digital poverty? Circle, do you have views on this? Well, I, I, I think I mentioned before about culturally appropriate way, yeah, because if, yeah, if you put in that Digital, fine, we can promote, yeah. That depends on the audience. At some point, some people doesn't want the digital, especially, I'll talk about the older generation if they take part your research, okay? Yeah, and they are, they are the migrant, how the migrant population um, to ask a digital, that you got to have some sort of the different way. It's not one set of method. It got to be multiple method to meet the, to meet the diverse community needs. That's what you're thinking behind that, yeah. Okay, thanks, Circle. Anyone else? Andrew, you've got your hand up. Andrew Freeman. Yeah, yeah. So there is already, and I can't, I'm blanking on the website address, there is already a repository for plain language summaries that a lot of industry already use. Um, and the reason I put my hand up was really just a, a, word, a word of warning. So there's a movement to have plain language summaries with registrations to summarize mm -hmm. the results to make them more broadly available. It makes a lot of sense. There's also a movement to have plain language summaries with the publication. And again, that makes a lot of sense, but the things are different. <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think there's an opportunity to be more joined up such so there's not, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, plain language summaries are essentially the same, the same data. So that's kind of thing that, that I think we need to try and iron out if we can to make things more streamlined and efficient. Okay. Um, there's a bit about pull and push in the chat as well, which makes sense. Okay, Will, just send to other questions. Uh, yeah, so if I could go to Fliss, please, to ask your question. Yeah, sure. Um, my question was around um, kind of, uh, we, we get a lot of like researchers that we fund um, asking about um, how they can involve patients in, in their work. Um, and my question is about like, how can uh, research funders um, like encourage researchers to take uh, patient involvement seriously? Um, and basically my question, I guess, was just sort of more generally, like what should we be doing as a research funder? I think maybe for you, Caroline, although I know, for example, NHR kind of insists that or, or a lot of funders now will ask about, have you involved the public in your research application? But Caroline, what do you think about more widely? Well, how can funders help encourage this good behaviours? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Fliss. Um, so firstly, NIHR does have a box. In fact, all the major funders mm -hmm. for patient facing research have got a box that says patient and public involvement. Um, and more are in, having another box which says, what are you doing to widen representation and to be inclusive in your research? Um, and that's something we've been campaigning for for a long time uh, because so much of our clinical trials, frankly, um, do not reflect um, the populations at highest risk with poorest outcomes. So prostate cancer is a great example of this. So I know that you're working really hard with that. Um, so we involved, um, we've been working with the Black African Caribbean and Black African Car um, community uh, because they've got double the risk of the white mm -hmm. British population and are very underrepresented. Um, so we went out to the community groups. We had two community researchers who worked with us and we've been doing research prioritization with them and by them. And we're very proud that two of the community researchers came to the first ever Black in Cancer conference with us and presented the findings of that. Um, so I keep going back to the fact that um, the funders, I mean, we've been told that the funders will resource proper and they are resourcing proper patient and public engagement, mm -hmm. but it needs to be not helicopter uh, researchers saying three weeks before a grant comes in or sometimes even less than that I need a PPI co-applicant on my grants your prostate cancer research have you got anybody um, who you could put us in touch with and um, you know that's no longer acceptable we need to normalize proper best practice across all of our uh, research and healthcare communities and that includes in industry. Hmm. Uh, no okay, thanks, Caroline. So I just need to warn everyone, we're now on our last question, and then I'm going to give some wrap-up comments so we finish on time. So, Will, who gets the last go? So, Stella, if I can come to you for the last question, that's okay. I was asking, what do the panel think about the increasing use of visual and graphical abstracts uh, as an aid to the paper? Because I've seen them used brilliantly in the BMJ to depict living guidelines for things like COVID management. And then I don't know if you saw the Christmas edition about George's marvelous medicine, which is an excellent way of explaining um, complex material in quite uh, an accessible manner. Not everybody could afford to do something like this, but Circle was talking about um, cartoons. And everybody's been saying, and Amanda said she'd like a cartoon version of her presentation. There are tools now that can do this. Is there any value in asking some people for a, a high impact story to present a visual or graphical interpretation of their research? Okay, let's go to Andrew George, who's a researcher who publishes. So you have some complex immune data with medians and whisker plots and regression lines and complex statistics you're going to get that into a cartoon andrew well i i i, I would struggle to do that but what i have done in my in, in the past is i have got the audience standing up and doing a dance based on my research uh, which was quite a frightening episode for them at least if not for me um you know actually a lot of this you know i really like all of this sort of stuff because actually some of this should be fun um, sometimes we're very, very serious about all of this and thinking about how can we write a two page article in easy read English. And yeah, we got to do all that. I agree with that. And it's right. But actually, some of this has got to be experiment. When you go out and you speak to uh, people, I, um, I, I, I speak to uh, all sorts of groups of people um, about research, um, not necessarily my research, but all about all all sorts of research and 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 I think if you go in and you enjoy it um and and you and you go in with a spirit of experimentation and openness and then willingness to listen to what the people are then I think you're going to start doing better communication um so yes is the answer whatever works and actually to some extent whatever floats your bet your 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 boat as a researcher or somebody involved in the dissemination as long as you listen to the people that you're trying to communicate to uh, and you get feedback from them so i'd go for it personally thanks andrew okay i want to thank all our panelists for being fantastic they've uh, tried to address as many questions as possible and also obviously to thank all the attendees for attending and asking those questions and I just want to flag up that there are questions we didn't get time to get through uh, everybody's questions, which is always a sign of a good interactive session. You won't be scrabbling around for 
when me having to ask questions because there's none coming from the audience. But we will make a note of those and we'll try and take your outstanding questions, a comment uh, away and uh, and think about those. They're not wasted by any means. Um, I've been asked just to share some final reflections. Um, so I'm just going to make four comments that draw on the four sessions I've attended, well, five sessions all week. Um, so the first is, how did this all start? Well, Andrew George was, was quite humble, but before Matt Westmore and I were ever part of the Health Research Authority, um, the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee was critical that we weren't doing enough about transparency. And Andrew, uh, uh, together with Juliet Tizard, who's moved on to the Parkinson Society, uh, they, they really led getting this transparency um, uh, campaign going. Why were the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee critical? Well, they were worried about two things. One, Andrew Freeman drew attention to. If you don't publish your research or register your research protocol in advance, and you just wait till you've done the research, you can do what's called data dredging. You can torture the data and find whatever results you want. So we're very keen on, on what are called pre-specified. That means you say in advance what you think the research is about and how you're going to analyze it and what your primary uh, out, what we call primary outcome. What's the thing you're most interested in? Is it death? Is it handicap? Is it three years disease-free survival? Whatever. So, you, so that's the first thing they were critical of. The second one was they were worried about negative results being buried. And actually that didn't turn out to be what people thought that what the House of Lords Committee had in mind was that particularly the pharmaceutical industry, if they did a trial and it didn't favor their new drug, they would just bury that. But when Ben Goldacre did research on this, it was actually the pharmaceutical industry were much better about publishing their results. And it was the public sector who were rather dilatory. And I suspect that's not due to them particularly wanting to bury the results. It's a mixture of inefficiency, laziness. They didn't find something exciting. They want to get on to the next thing. It's a mixture of journal editors not being very keen on publishing negative trials. It's a whole lot. But nevertheless, the messages that don't, you know, get get your own backyard in order first before you start criticizing everyone else. So um, I, I work in a university, as does Carolina, as does Andrew George, and we need to make sure that our colleagues are publishing uh, as well. So that's the first comment about where the transparency review came from. It, it was prompted by criticism by the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee. I think the second my the second point is the most powerful thing I think I heard all week was a comment about um, whose research is it anyway? And in fact, I would broaden that. Whose research is it? Whose body is it? Whose medical records are they? Whose blood is it? Whose tissue is it? If you remember, there was a famous film, I think from the 1980s, Whose Life Is It Anyway? About the, the capacity, actually, sad film about someone who'd been paralyzed from the neck down and their ability to control their own lives. But actually, the message is a good one about people like me are doing research. We need it. We need people to join our research and we use their records and their data and their blood and their tissue and it's their records. And so I think Matt Westmore or someone along the week used the word, the moral imperative. It, it does behove us to tell those people what happened. It's there. It's there. Whose research is it anyway? It's theirs. My third one has been a recurrent theme all week, and again today, and Circ already highlighted this, is that there's no point box ticking and going through the motions if the if the feedback, the summaries, the raising awareness is not comprehensible. Uh, I've been campaigning that it should have a re maximum reading age of 12 uh, or 13. That's that's what the government advised for all public service information, and there's online software you can use to put your summaries through that and find out what the reading age is. Uh, Circles reminded us there are seven, some of my research, I found out there are seven second languages in the UK that would cover about, I don't know, 95% of BME people. Obviously you can't translate into 190 languages, but there are seven languages. Um, I think uh, Circle mentioned uh, Polish, uh, Mandarin, Urdu, uh, Hindi, Arabic, I think they're the top five. I think French might be in the top seven. Um, uh, Welsh, I think, might be in the top seven. But anyway, you can translate into a number of languages. And also, many people have talked, as Stella finished, with about infographics, cartoons, visual representations that get around the problem of language completely. 
And my final and fourth comment is to go full circle with Amanda Wellings and Norm the Pigeon. The whole point is about making transparency the norm. And a previous chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davies, coined the phrase uh, in relation to people taking exercise and avoiding obesity, you need to make the right action the easy action. It's a big public sector message. And Andrew Freeman, and I think others highlighted that if if you just make it too complex, we, there's things we want people to do. If you make it too complex, people just won't do it. They don't have time to do it. So we need to make sure that we at the HRA make the process of, of giving uh, feedback to participants, of giving publishing clear summaries of results, of registering trials prospectively, uh, of raising awareness for people that being in a trial is generally a, a, you get better outcomes than if you're not in a trial. It, it, the onus is on us to make all of that straightforward and simple. And I promise you, we will all try and take that forward. So I'm going to give you back three minutes of your life that you didn't expect to get. It's 1427. Thank you all for joining us all week. Thank you again to the participants, to today's panelists, and not least to all of those, Will, Jacinta, and all the others at the Health Research Authority who made this week possible. So thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thank you.